Warning, we haven't gotten any less vulgar since last week. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Adam and Eve, HelloFresh, ZipRecruiter, and by The Recuperative Powers of Vacation. Vacation, because capitalism hasn't found a way to stomp that out entirely yet. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is Jennifer from San Antonio, Texas, and I am a librarian, which means I don't know everything, but I do know where to find it. And I can say for certain that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. You're so much better at that than me. It's October 7th. And it's Bring Your Bible to School Day. That's right, which means it's also Pour Satanic Milk on Your Bible Day at school. (laughs) Three votes. I have no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Joe Rogan's New Jersey, Cincinnati Red State and Red Town Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we paint the walls with a month's worth of stored-up anti-theism. Christianity gets persecuted by adorable seahorses. And Don Ford will be here, because damn it, you missed him too. But first, the diatribe. When I was a kid, I was often derided as a know-it-all. And I had a lot of trouble figuring out what the hell part of that was supposed to be an insult. Because sure, I, I mean, I didn't know at all, but it was a pretty candid admission that I knew so damn much more than the person insulting me that they couldn't tell the difference between that chasm and an infinite one. But our culture hates a know-it-all. And now, to be clear, the, the problem with a know-it-all, generally speaking, is they don't, in fact, know at all. We, we usually reserve that term for people who don't actually know much of anything and pretend they do. Uh, either that or we use it for people who go out of their way to correct minor points so they can show off their knowledge that birds totally count as dinosaurs in a cladistical sense. But At the same time, our culture still hates the more literal definition of a know-it-all as well. Now, I I want to distinguish here between the individual and the society because this comes across from some individuals that just, you know, don't like it when people know more shit than they do. And when somebody knows a lot more than them, they take that as a character flaw. But that's not quite the same as the cultural pushback that the know-it-all gets. That comes from certainty. If you know enough about something to authoritatively declare that another person is wrong, our society castigates you for being cocky. Doesn't matter if you're correct. Doesn't matter what your credentials are. The simple fact that you didn't pay respect to the random theory of a layperson makes you an asshole. And you'll hear this offered up sometimes as an explanation of why our culture hates atheists so much. Now, to a certain degree, that is true, but it's not an explanation of our society's prejudice so much as a byproduct of that prejudice. I mean, for realsies. Who tends to be more certain in their beliefs? It's the religious people who constantly talk about absolute faith and belief, regardless of the evidence that might come later. But for whatever reason, our culture forgives that certainty when it comes in the form of religious belief. We've been inoculated to it. Of course, religious people believe their religious beliefs absolutely in many people's minds. That's what makes the beliefs religious. Or take the other common explanation that says people hate atheists because our beliefs rob them of their own. But again, it's not like religious people aren't doing that. I mean, For fuck's sake, I'm not condemning anybody to the fiery pit of torture for eternity. I'm just admitting there's no afterlife. If me, a Christian and a Muslim all tell each other what we think happens to the other two when they die, I've got the best news in the room by far. But when Christians tell other people that they're going to hell or just imply that by believing that hell is a thing, our culture accepts that with a, you know, what are you going to do type shrug? When we tell people there's no evidence of life after death, we're suddenly the reason a grieving mother is sad. Now, to be clear, I'm talking about an unequal measurement here, but that's not to say that the other guys are starting at zero. Our culture, by and large, does look down on certainty, even in terms of religious belief, absolute religious belief. By and large, our culture encourages you to never be certain of anything if your knowledge might interfere with somebody else's sincerely held ignorance. You know, and, and I guess now that we're in the middle of a raging global pandemic, desperately trying to get people not to wash their fucking horse dewormer down with bleach, arguing with them about the shape of the planet and trying to convince them that climate change exists, some people are starting to wake up to the fact that this might be a problem. And all I'm saying is at least we kept some fucking seats warm for them. 
They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the all and beat of my back, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, <laughs> are you ready to make our triumphal return? He's slowly rising back up from the molten steel. Okay, we're just kidding. We're back already. <laughs> and here we are. Uh, two thumbs up. Now I know why you cry, because nobody could hear me podcast. Yep, that was it all <laughs> along. All right. Well, now that we're finally back together after a full month, I think it's a perfect time to pause for a word from our first sponsor this week, Adam and Eve. I just think I would be surprisingly good if 45 billion won was on the line. But so how does 45 billion won not make you winded walking up a flight of stairs, though? And all the games were not cardio, Noah. Some of guys, them were- guys, stop whatever you're doing. It's the most glorious time of the year. Uh, pumpkin spice latte season. 24 days till Halloween season. Yes. Well, kind of. It's test the waters with outfit stuff season. Sorry, test the water. Test the waters with outfit stuff season. Yes, right? Lots of Halloween parties, lots of costumed events. Hey, why don't you go as a nurse? Why don't I go as a cat boy? Boom. Outfit stuff. Oh. Okay, that's, that's pretty fucking smart, actually. Uh, so, okay, where can we get the uh, the outfit for the stuff? AdamandEve.com. What's AdamandEve.com? They are a sex and sex work positive, LGBTQ-friendly adult toy superstore. They've got costumes like bedside nurse and naughty maid service and slither into your DMs schoolgirl. Lots of good stuff. Ooh, those all sound great for outfit stuff. Really? I, I've never gotten the whole maid thing, right? Like, why does a person working here... No, even get out of the Adam and Eve ad. What are you talking about old? You're old. You're, you're old. Plus, you can get 50% off any one item and 10 free gifts when you enter our code SCATHING at checkout. That's SCATHING. S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G. Offer code scathing at checkout at adamandeve.com. All right, Heath. Now all I need is an invite to a costume party. Oh, actually, you said you're doing like a memorial thing for your dad this year. Do you think? No, I do not. Okay, boo. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, this week it was France's turn to reckon with the last century of church-sanctioned child torture. Uh, This came in the form of a 2,500-page report filed by a commission of doctors, historians, sociologists, and theologians who spent the last three years investigating allegations of child rape in the Catholic Church there. This commission, formed at the behest of the Bishops' Conference of France, interviewed over 6,500 victims and witnesses since 2018 and uncovered evidence of abuse by at least 3,000 abusers. But the truly jaw-dropping number that's actually catching all the headlines is the minimum estimate of victims. 333,000. Ooh, a COVID spike of child rape, if you will. Yeah. Now, I I need to take a second to put those numbers in perspective because I feel like a lot of Americans forget how small France is compared to us. Okay, we're talking about a country smaller than Texas with about as many people as, like, visit Walt Disney World every year. If all those victims were alive right now, they'd be like one out of every 200 French people. Worse still is the percentage of priests that represents of the estimated 115,000 priests that served in Catholic churches over the period they were investigating about 3% were child rapists. That's so much. Yeah. And again, (laughs) we cannot emphasize this enough. The other 97% definitely knew about it. Yeah. A lot. Okay. French people at church. uh, We're going to do a little experiment here. Look to your left. Now look to your right. You know what? Actually, just the left was plenty. Now run away. (laughs) You just saw a bunch of evil people. Yeah. Hey, if this helps put it into context for you, there are significantly more French Catholic priests raping kids than there are French Catholic priests willing to conduct a gay marriage. There you go. (sighs) That's a big number. And I have to add this very important caveat to all of these numbers. They're bullshit. Mm -hmm. As shockingly high as they are, they are way lower than the actual number of both victims and abusers. And that's because this commission was formed, as I said, by the Bishop's Conference of France. And it relied on internal church documents as its primary source of information. Oh, is that not an independent body? Yeah, no, believe it or not. Yeah, no. And by some wild coincidence, out of all the hundreds of thousands of cases of abuse that were documented, a grand total of 20 are still within the statute of limitations to deal with living abusers. Huh. Yeah, the other 332,980 all just happen to be cases that can't be prosecuted. So either 
The Catholic Church in France almost completely fixed the problem pretty much exactly 30 years ago, which was, I should remind everybody, before the problem came to the attention of the general public, or they're lying about the recent shit and continuing to cover up for abusers. Feels mm-hmm. like the second thing. And also, they couldn't even make their lie look good. No, they could not. They got commissioned by themselves to investigate themselves. And they're basically announcing the lie at a press conference and 20 priests are right behind the podium abusing kids. <laughs> yes. Stop being Catholic. Yeah. Right. But that also means that like internally there was like a, well, we cannot say we know about zero child rapists active in our organization. How many is an acceptable number of yes. active child rapists? 20? I feel like people won't freak out about 20, right? Like, yeah. everyone's got 20. Oh, yeah. Rapists. That was a meeting. <laughs> they had that meeting. Yes. Of course. Now, the report also comes up with a bunch of recommendations about how the church can stop covering up child rape in the future. It's super hard to do for them, apparently. And they largely mirrored the recommendations of the aforementioned hundreds of other identical reports issued by groups all around the world. And I'm sure that they'll implement some of them and they'll make good and damn sure that there are plenty of reporters there to document it when they do. Because as fucked up as it is to say this, this report about how many kids they raped is actually Catholic PR. Yeah. It's it's all part of a coordinated effort to convince people that this is a problem of the past, that the present iteration of the church is just as every bit as devastated by as we are. And, and I'm sure 50 years from now, that iteration of the church will issue a report about how devastated they are by the 2021 priests. But to be clear, nothing significant has changed. And the Catholic Church is still primarily a child rape cabal. Yep, that's the service they provide. Yep. And in Pat Roberts' so long farewell news, 91-year-old host of the 700 Club and truly one of atheism's best advocates, (laughs) Pat Robertson announced his semi-retirement this week. And, oh, gosh darn it, I'm going to miss that jiggly-cheeked bastard. I just, (laughs) I thought we'd have more time, Pat. I thought we'd have more time. Yeah, it's really sad. I think he finally melted you know, completely and enveloped himself like a mosquito in amber. It had to happen. <laughs> yes. in so maybe one day they'll make an island of Pat Robertson's as a theme. Yeah, park there you go. There you go. Yeah, as much as I hate the guy, he was a bit of a headline safety valve for us over the years, right? <laughs> you didn't have enough stories to fill the segment. You'd just go, okay, that's, I'm sure P Robes talked this week. Let me just <laughs> check. Get desperate, I can go on their YouTube. There it is. Yep. A yep. baby can be a demon. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. I got a story. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. So, yeah, a mere 60 years after starting the Christian Broadcasting Network and 54 years after becoming the host of the 700 Club, because the original host was a rapist who stole millions yep. of dollars from the network. That's why. Robertson is shambling down. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on how much he's given us over the years from telling callers that yes, their grandbaby could be a demon to warning people they could get AIDS from towels. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He always had something new and stupid to say. And gosh, I will just always be grateful to him for that bucket of crazy. Well, And the fact that he managed to do it all of it while looking like a light bulb after a house fire was just icing on the cake. Wasn't (laughs) it? He really did. He really did. Now, The good news is that P. Robes isn't entirely gone from our hearts and podcast. He will still be making monthly appearances as his son takes over his full-time host, so we can wean ourselves off of his crazy slowly. But here's hoping, like mild-mannered sons of famous Christians before him, looking at you, Jerry Falwell Jr., (laughs) his kid turns out to be an even crazier provider of material for our podcast. There you go. There you go. It could happen. And in Grift of the Gab news, fantastic. thanks to Right Wing Watch, we learned that right wing piece of shit Stu Peters interviewed right wing piece of shit Andrew Torba last week. Torba is the founder of right wing piece of shit Twitter, (laughs) also known as Gab. Well, on the rare occasion that it is indeed known, but yes. Right. (laughs) And working. And uh, Torba had a big announcement. He seems to be under the impression that he's launching a parallel society just for conservatives where they can enjoy their quote freedom family god and guns to be clear he is not he's not doing that but that's what he said that's what he thinks is happening hey if launching a website creates a parallel society i'm the fucking watcher (laughs) (laughs) all right so 
The discussion started with Stu Peters asking, are you talking about creating an entire society? Is that a secession? And Torba responded, it's a silent secession. That's what he said into a microphone during <laughs> yeah, an yeah. interview. So, audio, audio. <laughs> then he added, our mission is to build a parallel society. We're building a parallel economy, a parallel internet. End of society stuff I could name. Just, <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. And just to be clear, again, no, you're no. not. He thinks Christian right PayPal is an economy. And he thinks Christian right Twitter and Christian right YouTube is a parallel internet. All of which, just, you know, for the record, happens on something called the Internet mm -hmm. yep. as part of something called the economy. Mm -hmm. It seems like I might have found an intersection of those <laughs> parallel lines. Something's wrong. Yeah, buddy, terrorism that MasterCard is willing to ignore while they're busy shutting down Pornhub and OnlyFans isn't an underwater city patrolled by Big Brother. It's just <laughs> so, terrorism. But, but it is worth noting how often they think they need a right-wing alternative to left-wing just the thing yeah right <laughs> like, i mean let's not forget that, that the thing that they're aspirationally moving in parallel to is reality stuff that happens yes. for real right yeah. right wing uber they're parallel to that in their heads <laughs> right yes <laughs> we promise your driver will be racist <laughs> i'm not saying they're not accurate in a lot of ways no like that, but it's a dumb idea so yeah He's going to build a new society with off-brand Twitter, just like he's going to throw away his furniture and make his whole house into different levels, like ancient mm -hmm. Egypt. <laughs> Absolutely not happening. But I would love to see him try it. I'd yes. love to see Neckbeard build his own internet and his own general concept of money and <laughs> commerce. Yes. Please do that. Please try. All right. Now, for three Steve Bucks, you get access to racist Twitter and this here bottle of water I brought for us all to survive <laughs> yes. off of. Where are you guys going? Oh, Where are you going? He's doing the grown-up equivalent of drawing plans for the fort they're going to build when Dad lets them use the hammer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and here's my favorite part. At the bottom of the screen during this entire exchange, it says in big letters, Gab. The Alamo of free speech. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> which which yep. means not a single person involved in producing StuPeters.tv, including definitely Stu Peters, not a single person knows who won that battle. Yeah, right. <laughs> or best case scenario, they're planning to, you know, die in a hail of gunfire to protect the free speech they already have. Uh -huh. And then some <laughs> other group is going to win a battle six weeks later to win back the free speech that everybody had. Already had. <laughs> One can only hope, Heath. One can only <laughs> hope. <laughs> and in Know Your Role Play News. Nice. You know, Christians have done a lot of awful stuff over the past couple of years. They overturned Roe versus Wade. That was a bummer. Mm -hmm. They tried to overthrow the government in a literal coup. Yep. Another bummer. They created an abortion hunting free market in Texas. But this time, they've gone too far. This week, they came for outfit stuff. And my <laughs> friends, enough is enough. What? Yeah, I let, let's face it. For most of us, our line in the sand is the footprint we're making in that moment, right? So. Yep. Yeah. So here's the story. This comes to us from preacher John Piper, of whom an anonymous viewer asked the following question, quote, my husband likes to use role playing in the bedroom and various levels of bondage and dominance. He wants me to say things like I am your slave. He wants me to wear certain collars around my neck, but he's a very nice person outside of the bedroom. He only asks if we can play out the fantasy in bed. What should I do? End quote. OK, uh, I think the answer is re-examine your entire worldview that doesn't say do what you want with consenting adults when there's a sex question the answer by the way regardless is definitely not ask pastor john piper well, for an answer. Uh, maybe <laughs> pastor john piper could be a sub we don't know he might have useful advice okay he looks like a power bottom he's got that gleam in his <laughs> eye right that assertiveness mm -hmm. so before we get to john's fucking bananas answer quick psa don't do any kind of sex stuff you don't want to do. There you go. Role play or otherwise. Yep. I, I know for a lot of you, that's a no brainer, but just a bunch of folks who listen to our show weren't raised with good and healthy ideas about consent. So just for the record, if you're not enthusiastically into anything, you don't have to do it. But that, of course, is not John's response. No. Nope. John's response <laughs> is that it violates the holy 
institution of outfit stuff. What? Here's what he had to say. Quote, fantasize sin is sin, no matter how many people agree to it. End quote. And, and before you ask, do not dress up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's a sin. She is Jewish. So. <laughs> so, but wait, but don't. Okay, by that argument, then when they reenact the crucifixion, they're killing Jesus, though, right? Oh, we could catch him in like <laughs> a, a really Dormammu loop if we told him that. Exactly. <laughs> he continued, "Quote: If you need ever more kinky sex, ever more bizarre, unconventional sexual acts at the expense of your spouse's enjoyment, you are elevating your appetite above his or her delights." That's not the way of Christ. <laughs> wait, wait, what is the... I want to know the fucking way of Christ. Side note, I will be referring to my sexual libido as my delights from now on. And and I'll be referring to mine as the way of Christ. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. But don't worry. His advice wasn't all fuddy-duddy kink shaming. We also got a fascinating insight into Piper's own fantasy life when it came time to give examples. He concluded... So you heard the question. He concludes by saying, quote, if you mutually agree to pretend you're having sex in Times Square with a thousand people watching, it is a sin. If you mutually <laughs> agree to pretend that you are two strangers who happened upon each other in the woods and have sex, <laughs> you are sinning, end quote. Well, here, at least you mutually <laughs> agree to take a listener question about bondage and then you really want to get railed by a druid while you're eating dog food in the grove of oak trees in my backyard. <laughs> Sir, can you repeat the question? What were we? <laughs> you go. Somebody else go. Why would it's just she gave you examples in the question. <laughs> also, go to Times Square, man. Do your thing. Do your Enjoy. Thing. New York absolutely. does not care. They won't even step around. They'll just go over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think we can all agree that Christianity has crossed its final line. We're all officially atheists now that they've come for out and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. On the plus side. I am 100% going to be thinking about getting it on in front of those off-brand Elmos in Times Square <laughs> exactly. next time I indulge my delight. So it's not all bad, yeah. is, is what I'm saying. All right. Well, I think we all have some increasingly graphic kinks to write viewer questions to John Piper about now. So we're going to pause for a quick break for a word from our second sponsor this week, HelloFresh. B-U-S-Y-C-O-O-K-I-E, busy cookie. What's a cookie busy doing? Be a busy. Well, hey there, Noah. What are you doing? No, don't don't do that. Well, Eli, I was wait wait. Why are you talking like that? Oh, so it's just a bunch of people said how much they liked it when you and Lucinda were doing the ads. So mm -hmm. I figured I could I could sort of keep the spirit going. I'm I'm sorry. That was supposed to be my wife. Yeah, you know it's, it's a southern <sighs> accent. No, told you not to do that. Okay, so. If you give me $1,000, I will not tell Lucinda that your Dolly Parton voice and your impersonation of her are the same voice. Dude, that's a really good deal. You should take it. Guys, come on. I mean, it's not like they don't sound Lucinda, anything. Lucinda, guess what Eli's doing? No, come back. I changed my mind. I will give you $1,000. This was a Hello Fresh ad, everybody. So just make sure that you... You know what? We're not getting paid for this one. Never mind. <laughs> And we're back. Next up in headlines in putting the RG back in clergy news tonight. Does it, does it? <laughs> We've done a lot of stories over the years about priests stealing money from their churches for gay sex parties. So many. Like more than I anticipated when we started the show. I'm going to go ahead and say so many, in fact, that when I saw the headline, Italian priest allegedly stole $117,000 from church for drug field gay orgies, my first thought was... Yeah. Wait, was this a new one or is this an uh, update? <laughs> I literally thought this was an old story and I checked the date. Me too. This is new. Yeah. This is new. But yeah, apparently yet another priest was raiding the coffers to supplement his drug-fueled orgy budget. And before we make the mistake of celebrating this as possibly the best use of funds ever donated to the Catholic Church, I should specify exactly <laughs> which drug was fueling the orgy. The reason we know about this is that the cops got suspicious when the dude's roommate, quote, imported a liter of the common date rape drug GHB from the Netherlands, Ugh. end quote. Okay, that's terrifying for so many reasons, including the word common yeah. in that yeah. phrase. I'm sorry, a guy can't knock himself on his ass with some GHB without being lumped in with Brock Turner all of a sudden? Yeah. That GHB is for me, sheeple, and I consent. <laughs> so, I consent. No, that's no, a little that's, treat for Eli. No, that's <sighs> true. It is. It can be quite 
a little treat. So I, I'm not sure whether to call this guy the hero or the villain. So I'm just going to say the central figure in this story <laughs> is Francesco Spagnisi. So close to spaghetti. Not His really. So it's just an S P. An S-P. But yeah. So he's a 40 year old Catholic priest in Italy that virtually every non atheist resource identified as highly regarded. One of them even noted that his homilies were, quote, sparkling, end quote. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, his apartment was apparently raided mid-drug-fueled gay sex party a couple of weeks ago where cops observed, I mean, drug-fueled gay sex, Probably obviously, but, but they also found a couple of homemade crack pipes while they were raiding it. Okay, that's a weird detail. It, it feels like when you embezzle a hundred grand to fund your party... You don't smoke your crack from a fucking apple like a teenager. <laughs> no, no, I get it. Because you don't want the guy at the head shop to be like, hey, you're never going to guess which highly regarded and sparkling orator I sold a crack pipe to tonight. <laughs> you know, you got to. <laughs> it's about privacy. No, uh, apparently this is far from his first drug orgy. Uh, police interviewed at least 200 people who had attended similar parties in the past. And this one wasn't the first he allegedly funded with stolen church funds either. According to police, Spagnisi withdrew over $117,000 from the parish's bank account, which he told his boss was being used to help the poor. Assuming the poor in question were selling drugs, that's probably true. But in light of that theft, the bishop cut off his access to the church's accounts, at which time he started stealing money from the mass collection and just asking parishioners for funds directly. Hey, uh, guys, is it weird that this week's tithe went into a liquor store plastic bag? <laughs> it feels weird, right? <laughs> Now, it's also worth adding, by the way, that as near as I can tell, no charges have been filed in this case, which is kind of fucked up. OK, like, obviously, I have no issues whatsoever with drug fueled gay sex parties. Those are the best kind of gay sex parties. Thank you. Yes, obviously. Absolutely. And, and, and I'd, I'd much, much rather see Catholic funds going to that than anywhere but into the pockets of their sex abuse victims, really. And, and of course, the money belongs to the parish. So it's up to them if they want to press charges. And, and so far, they don't. But in the end. They are collecting money under the auspices of charity work and shit. Then they're using it for personal shit and then forgiving themselves for lying. Yep. And the entire business model of all religions or not, that's still immoral <laughs> as all hell. Mm hmm. And in hospitality news, as we record this episode on October 6th of 2021, the single most detrimental thing to the average American's public health is their unvaccinated neighbors. Whether you're vaccinated or not, the unvaccinated are among us, causing breakthrough cases, clogging up emergency rooms, raising healthcare premiums, and just generally making the world a worse place. Yep. And while that problem is solving itself at around 2,000 people a day, it is important to note that depending on what source you use, one to 5% of those plague spreaders have a special magic permission to kill their fellow Americans that's called a religious exemption. Now, again, depending on what source you use, as much as 5% of unvaccinated Americans have special permission from God legally to get you sick and kill you. Yep. But luckily for us, the administrators at the Conway Regional Health System in Arkansas are calling the religious as bluff among their employees, and it is fabulous. Yeah, it really is. But before we get to that, I want to point this out, okay, because religious people are constantly trying to defend this by saying, well, those people aren't really religious. They're just using the religion. They're not really, that's not really coming from it. But so, you know, as tempting as it is to dismiss that as a no true Scotsman fallacy, it's easy to miss the fact that that actually makes it worse. Right. Right. So like that, just, just don't throw that away. Just point out to them. That's a point on our side. The fact that there's no way to measure religious sincerity isn't even a fallacious defense. It's a point for us. Yeah. So one of the reasons that folks are claiming a religious exemption from taking the vaccine is because it was developed using aborted fetal cell tissue, which. No, it wasn't. It was tested using cells grown from aborted fetal cell tissue from the late 70s, early 80s. Saying the vaccine was developed with aborted fetal cell tissue is like saying there's three protozoa as the hosts of this podcast. <laughs> but I digress. That's what they're saying. So when about 5% of the staff at the privately run Conway Regional Health System requested religious or medical exemptions to the vaccine, the hospital administration distributed a form that listed over 30 medications that were 
also tested on fetal cell tissue, including <laughs> Zoloft, Tylenol, Preparation H, and acetaminophen. <laughs> Amazing. And just asked those who requested religious exemption to affirm that they have never and will never <laughs> take those other medications either, saying, quote, Staff who are sincere should have no hesitancy with agreeing to this list of medicines, end quote. <laughs> Such good work by Conway Regional Health System. And also, I cannot wait to see the guy who agrees to that. Right. He's just like, I got a raging migraine. My hemorrhoids look like I'm birthing a Chicago pizza. But I'm a fucking Christian <laughs> and I'm doing this. Oh yeah, I'm honestly pretty conflicted about how hard I want to push back on the Real Christians won't take medicine trend. You know? <laughs> Roll them <laughs> dice. And look, as awesome as this form is, it, it is sadly unenforceable. Yeah. Right? R religious exemptions don't need to be tied to consistency or reality because if they did, they wouldn't be religious. Right. But right. one more signed form where these people have to acknowledge their own stupidity and hypocrisy. Well, my friends, that's always a good thing. There you go. And finally tonight. We have a new challenger entering oh. the ring in the Moms Having Christian Freakouts Kumite. Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian Freakout. That's right. We got a Christian Freakout. The reigning champs of the Freakout Kumite are, of course, one million moms. We're only about 996 thousandths of a million away from having their retirement <laughs> so almost there yeah no in terms of order of magnitude you guys are like halfway there yeah <laughs> ladies but now they have some competition from a group called moms for liberty that's trying to ban a giant list of children's books from the williamson county school district in tennessee right and this actually makes their title Less accurate than one million miles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is almost impressive in a way. Liberty? It's the opposite. No, no. So <laughs> Moms for Liberty made headlines last week when the Daily Beast reported on their book protest. And the object of their crusade? They don't want kids learning about climate change, heretical science in general, and of course... Seahorses fucking. Seahorses fucking. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, I don't want my kid learning about climate change either. I mean, that shit's spooky. Yeah. Do you see some of this? That seems I real, real unfun. And until we have a clearer handle also on what parts of psychology are and aren't genetic, I kind of don't want your kid learning about seahorses fucking either. Really. Well, <laughs> it's part of every growing young man's life to fuck a sea monkey. No. What? I said what I said. I feel like we've uh, taken a tangent now. Move so. on. <laughs> Let's go ahead and meet the new challengers. Ooh, look at me. I never fucked my sea monkeys. <laughs> the moving just right past it. The <laughs> co-founders of Moms for Liberty are Tina Descovich and Tiffany Justice, who spent the last year and a half making sure schools have more COVID and less science. Yeah. But they got distracted by the real problem, seahorse fucking. Sure. And that's when they found a bunch of other very serious problems with the reading list for the kids there. So they made a spreadsheet to document all the evil books and they sent it to the school board in protest. Now, quick thing, that's not how spreadsheets work. They're not no. adding up columns of their panicky complaints with formulas. You can't add that stuff. Whatever. They wanted rows, whatever. So that's what they did. They it's sent a, a list. A list. Heath, I'm confused. You're saying you don't enjoy how I organize everything you guys have ever let me be in charge of in a spreadsheet with different size rows and columns I don't label? I don't say it's not. I, I'm actually mad every time. So <laughs> here's a few of the problems they found. I'll start with a book about hurricanes. According to the Moms for Liberty, kids can't be at liberty to learn about the destructive power of hurricanes. What? Also, Johnny Appleseed is no good because, quote, okay. the story is sad and dark. What? <laughs> and a book about owls was problematic, too. According to the complaint, it's a sad book. But turns out, okay, <laughs> not a book I would want to read for fun. What? Said a grown-up in a functionless spreadsheet. <laughs> guys, guys, did we start accidentally diarying in our banned book lists again? We need to talk <laughs> about this, guys. I just, I kind of want to get my hands on the gritty reboot of Johnny Appleseed that they read, though, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Liam Neeson stars in it. It's great. <laughs> really good. And that brings us to the seahorse fucking. The complaint says a book about seahorses is unacceptable because it depicts, quote, 
mating seahorses with pictures of postions sick, and discussions of the male carrying the eggs. And they think, I guess, little kids are going to see this picture book and start non-binary fucking all over the kindergarten room? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I, I mean, admittedly, I thought it was a little weird that the female seahorse is doing an ahagaho face, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the illustrator's choice. Moving on, on top of all that that I just mentioned, they also complained constantly about history books for having too much history yep. in them, especially the parts about terrible white people doing slavery stuff, which it tells those people to do in the Bible at multiple yeah. moments. And that's critical race theory. No, it's not. No. Absolutely no, it's not. <laughs> in one complaint, they said, quote, the entire book is filled with war and killing and blood and graphic images. So they want more Bibles in schools <laughs> instead. <laughs> All right, well. I guess now that Heath has gotten everybody in the mood for seahorse porn, we're going to have to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Come on, G. And when we come back, Don Ford will be here too late for the seahorse fuck stuff yet again. Every week. I mean, kids these days. You know? Right? Yeah. Hoop and stick. Now, that, that was a game. Yes, that was great. Hey, guys, what you doing oh hey Eli. well now that heath and i are both over the age of 40 we have to do old guy complainy stuff every 48 hours or we turn into hippie dads hippie dads yeah sadly those are the two choices old coot or hippie dad handing out beer to 13 year olds at a quinceanera that's it that feels very specific and i mean nobody wants to work anymore oh nobody wants to work anymore the worst actually guys lots of people want to work and the best place to find them is zip recruiter what's ZipRecruiter. It's the smartest way to hire. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, they send you the most qualified people for your job. Then you can easily review the candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job. In fact, according to ZipRecruiter's internal data, jobs where employers use ZipRecruiter's invite to apply get, on average, two and a half times more candidates, which helps make for a faster hiring process. Wow, that does sound good. See for yourself. Just go to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. That's S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay. But hoop and a stick, though. Hoop and stick, exactly. How do you go to Italy and not have Domino's pizza? That's where it's oh from. God. I'm not explaining this again. It's a domino. It's not better. It's hey, guys. Don't do that. You guys ready for uh, Bible Peace Theater? Mm, Bible Peace Theater. It's been so long. Remind me. The shows the... weren't gone. That bit doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, so the part of the podcast where we act out the Bible with sketches and songs and shit. Right. Right. Of course. Okay. Don't indulge him. And Don's here, by the way. Hi, Don. Hi, Heath. Hello. Shit. Don, when did you get here? Uh, right when you asked Heath if he got to see the original Pizza Hut. I know. Can you believe that he missed it? Uh, yes, I can. You don't even go here. So where were we in the Bible? Okay, so Solomon is king and he's very, very wise. Yeah, he threatened to cut those prostitutes baby in half. Yes, right. I remember that. So what happens next? Okay, so there's a couple of chapters of impossible math. Impossible math? Yeah, it's like um, it says the Israelites were as numerous as the sands in the sea that... David got a near infinite amount of animal sacrifices per day. He had 40,000 stalls of horses. He had just a bunch of really unrealistic numbers. Uh, question. Oh, we're doing questions now. Yeah. So I've always wondered, how come this stuff stayed in the Bible? Right? Like, I get that the parts with the talking snake and the universe being made out of nothing made it in. But, like, ancient people had sand, right? Mm -hmm. They knew that sand was, like, too big a number way back then even yeah right it's it's a little complicated so and it also depends on who you believe and how the book is translated right so like one theory is that the term as many as there are grains in the sea actually meant spanning to the nearest body of water right or it could be a translation error as the greek the bible is largely translated from has similar english translations for different numbers or it could be something that got changed in a secret papal council because the original math didn't work out. So they just changed it to be impossibly big numbers that were hard to question. 
Okay, so we don't know why the Bible is wrong because it's wrong in so many different ways. In so many ways, yes, yes pretty much. Yeah. Okay, this book is stupid. Yep. Sure yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what? What happens after the bad math? Okay, well, now it's time to build a giant temple to God. So he writes to the king of Tyre for some supplies. Hiram, king of Tyre, can I have some of your trees for our new temple? Best Solomon, the new king of Israel. Solomon, totally, absolutely. Big fan of David, happy to help. Sending trees right away. Uh, all I ask is that you feed my people your very good friend, Hiram. Sending you 10,000 bushels of grain a year and some oil too, with thanks, Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, so I feel like that's not feeding my people, but I guess pancakes, whatever. Uh, I'm sure you'll get me back, buddy. Solomon, love, Hiram. And then there's like four chapters of how big the temple is and how big Solomon's palace is and how many bathrooms it has. And Wow, re really? Yeah, it goes on for a while. That seems like it would be hard for us to make funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I've got it. And now, back to House of God Hunters. This is Yahweh, God of the Hebrews, he and his servant Solomon are looking for a one-temple home in the middle of the desert. All right, Solomon, God, you've seen three houses now. Do you have a favorite? Gosh, it's so hard to choose. Oh, it really is. I love that last one that had like 2,000 baths. Right? I mean, you guys don't know about running water yet, so you can just take a bath and wall up that room. Wall up the room. That's what I was thinking. And the silver handles on the doors? Oh, so elegant. Mm hmm So, what do we think? Oh, we'll take it. Oh, my God, are we doing this? We're doing this! You watch a lot of House Hunters over vacation. I was buddy. on a lot of planes. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, the temple is finished, and Solomon is going to make a speech to his people. Um, okay, everyone, if I could have your attention, just real quick, so it's come to my attention that this book has kind of followed a pattern so far. And Is it the sexism? Or the brutality? The racism? Uh, no, 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 not any of those. It, the, the genocide. Uh, Is it all the genocide? No, 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 please, that makes please, sense. Please stop guessing. Um, it's that you guys do something bad, and then God gets mad and kills you, and then you say, sorry, and then the cycle starts over again. So... I built this giant temple, which God is a really big fan of. So much space for activities. That's right. And I've sacrificed him like eight majillion animals. So here's the thing. Next time you do something bad and God is going to smite you or make you sick or whatever, just come here and he should calm down. There's even a TV in the bathroom. That's right, buddy. There sure is. So cool. So then the Queen of Sheba comes to visit Solomon and see all his awesome stuff. Hail King Solomon. I have come to see our many wonders of your kingdom. Well, thank you, Queen Sheba. You are most welcome. At uh, King Solomon. Hi. Hi. I'm Hiram. Kind of Solomon's best friend. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Hi. Anyway, Hi. Hiram. I have come bearing 120 talents of gold. Wow. 120. That's great. That's a great gift. Oh, Good. yes. Good. We are most grateful, Queen of Sheba. I actually gave him 420 talents of gold as a gift, which is like a lot more. And it's also the super funny weed number, 420, but... But yours is good, too. That's, that's cool. That's Indeed. nice of you. Indeed. Our two kingdoms shall be... Oh, hey, be actually, that reminds me, Solomon. <laughs> I meant to tell you, I also brought you some uh, almug trees. So, yeah, you're like, uh, you're welcome or whatever. No big deal. Uh, what's, what's an almug tree? <laughs> oh, they're like super rare and valuable trees. Probably like 120 talents of gold apiece per almug tree. But it's no big deal. Sorry, Queen of Sheba, you were doing your tiny little itsy bitsy gift thing and uh, I interrupted. Go ahead. Sorry. I've actually never heard of an almug tree either. Yeah, no, that's that's that makes sense. They're super rare. 
super rare. Trace. Um, Hiram? Yes, Solomon? Maybe give me and the Queen of Sheba the room. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Nobody wants a third wheel, right? Except for, like, you know, tricycles and wheelbarrows, where the third wheel is actually, it's the most important wheel in some cases. But yeah, I totally get it. Hiram! Right, no, going, I'm going, I'm going. As I was saying. Sorry, dude, just real quick, Solomon, <laughs> uh, I also brought you some gems, too. Like, super big gems, you can see. Hiram! This is... They're big. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm gone. It's nice to meet you. I like your uh, your makeup. It's very um, it's very a lot of it. Hiram. I'm going. I'm gone. But even Solomon the Wise eventually abandoned God for one of the most tragic reasons wise people fall. <gasps> What's that? Dating someone terrible. Oh. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. No, you are Snooky Wookum. Oh my god, like you're the Snooky Wookum. <clears throat> King Solomon? Oh, hey Hiram. What's up? You've met uh Ashley, right? No, no. I uh, don't think I've met Ashley. Um she one of your 700 wives and 300 concubines? Yes. And she's a Snooky Wookum. Uh, oh my god, no, you are. It's nice to meet you, Myron. It's It's Hiram. Uh sorry. Do you have a tattoo on your face? Yeah, it's because I'm a Virgo. Like, like that's what it means, or or just Virgos get face tattoos? Both. Okay, you said that like it was a question. You know what? Never mind, Solomon. I noticed you were building temples on the high places to other gods. Oh yes, yes, that was Ashley's idea, wasn't it, babe? Totally, I thought of it. Oh, cool. Yeah, she's helping out with the thing we. We do together, the two of us. That's a fun surprise. Um, Ashley, do you build temples? Do you know a lot about that stuff? No, I work at the Fashion Bug, but all my friends tell me I'm like super smart and should smart. Build temples. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I'm um, sure they do. Well, I love when strangers join in on uh, the thing that we do together. That's great for me. This is great. This is great. See, I love this. See, I told you he'd be cool about it. I was actually like a little nervous that you wouldn't be cool. <laughs> what? Nervous? Why? Why would you be nervous giving input on a thing that? We are experts at just because you're fucking one of us. Why would that See, be? See, that's exactly what I said. He said that. He did say that. Okay, great, great. Well, uh, Solomon, do you still want to go to lunch with me? Um, we had the plans to go to lunch. Do you want to oh, do that? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Ashley, do you want to come to lunch? Or? Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. But Ashley it too. has to be gluten-free, cool. and we really do need to bring my brother. What? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sure he's welcome. He's crashing with us for a couple of days. Yeah, he got fired from Buffalo Wild Wings because they're racist against white people. But we have to pick him up, though. His chariot has a breathalyzer. Oh, that's no problem, Snooky Wilkum. He's your family, and that means he's <sighs> our family, right, Iram? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go get your brother who who got fired. Right. Kind of like that. Anyway, God creates two enemies for Solomon as punishment and promises to take the kingdom away from his son. He'd take it away from him, but he only gave Solomon the kingdom as a punishment to David. So, yeah, it's hard to keep track of who you're taking a kingdom away from if you're giving it to. Precisely, yeah. So, so now it's time to meet Jeroboam, a man of mighty valor. Jeroboam! Jeroboam! Well, hello there, Ahijah the prophet. How can I help you? Seriously, Ahijah the prophet? Is there another guy earlier in the book named Jesus we're going to find okay, out I, about? I, I didn't there... write the book, man. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, what can I do for you, Ahijah? Me. Yeah. My, my shirt. Here, take these ten pieces, for God has said he will tear Solomon's kingdom to pieces and give ten of them to you. Oh, okay. I uh, feel like you could have just told me that, though. Well, because he's saving one part of the kingdom for Solomon's son because of David. So, you know, just now you know. So uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, what does that have to do with tearing up my shirt? Well, I think you can't have this piece. It's mine. Of of my shirt? Yes. This is a weird prophecy, man. You're a weird prophecy. So Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam goes to the city of Shechem to officially be made king. Rehoboam, before we make you king, the people and I have something to say. Very well, Jeroboam. What is it? Your dad was like a super-duper jerk to us. 
All of his solutions were cutting stuff in half. And he brought his girlfriend to stuff without asking. Okay, okay, got it. So, um, give me three days and I'll have an answer for you. All right, we didn't really ask you for a for an answer. I said three days. Okay. All right, advisors, young and old, what do I say to my people now? You must be kind to them. Speak softly and do not anger them. Okay, good idea. And uh, young guys, ideas? Yeah, man, fucking, so here's what you gotta do. You gotta, like, straight up, walk up to their faces and just, like, totally establish dominance. Like, I, ha, have you studied any NLP? Um, no. Oh, God, we have so far to go. Okay, so, like, here's the first thing you need to say. You need to walk out there and you need to be like, my pinky is thicker than my dad's dick. You, sorry, what? My pinky is thicker. No, no, than, no, I heard the words you said. What does that mean? Oh, it means, like, I'm gonna be even harder on you. How does it mean that? And then, then you say, if my dad whipped you, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. Uh, okay, again, that feels cumbersome. Dude, 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 dude. Do you want to lead or do you want to follow? Uh, lead, I guess. Exactly. Yes, lead. Now, do you want some of this caffeinated matcha mixture I drink to hack my brain? It is so much better than coffee. Yeah, okay. Mm. Oh, God, that's awful. Fuck really? Yeah, dude, you are ready. I don't think he's ready. I am not vaccinated. People of Israel, I have something to, uh, something to tell you. Tell him about your dad's dick. Right. Um, yeah, so my dad's dick is, my pinky is thicker than my dad's dick. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, also going to whip you with scorpions. What does that even mean? Are you going to tie them to stuff and then whip us with them? Because that sounds like it's more dangerous for you. Right. Yeah, well, I, we quit hmm. the Israel. Wait, what? Y you guys don't get it. I I'm, I'm laterally integrating here. You That's sound happening. unvaccinated. You're unvaccinated. Hey, hey, everyone. What's going on here? Your guy sounds super unvaccinated. I was leading through lateral thinking. Everybody, everybody, relax. Why don't we all head to our various cities and we can figure out who's king next month. But you promised with a torn shirt thing. I said, let's all head back to our sweet temples with the TV in the bathroom and think about it. Okay? Right. Well, I don't know. about having a warrior mindset. I hate you. I hate myself. And now that Eli's established that kids these days suck, I guess we can close things off for now, but we'll be back next month with even more Bible Peace Theater. It's time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. This is the part of the show that has nothing to do with analingus. You're thinking of the back feed segment. This is the part where we answer your emails, tweets, and general concerns. Well, now I'm mad that I signed up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Our first piece of feedback comes from several places. Our friends Tom and Cecil over on the Cognitive Dissonance podcast recently talked about a story on Jezebel called The Spooky, Loosely Regulated World of Online Therapy. The article specifically talks about one of our sponsors, BetterHelp, and raises concerns about the way they share user data. And several listeners have reached out to ask if we were aware of the article and if we're going to continue to advertise for them as a result. Yeah. So, OK, so I read the article and I have to say, I, I don't believe it merits disassociating ourselves from the company. Mm -mm. Now, to be clear, the article is not about BetterHelp sharing details of your therapy or of your mental health or your mental health diagnosis with third parties. That'd be illegal as all fuck. What they're sharing is data on how often you use the app and when, which they're sharing with third party tracking services, just like pretty much every app that exists. Like we do that, right? If you log onto one of our websites, third party tracking services know when and for how long and all that shit. App developers need that stuff for analytics. The concern the article brings up, and it's a legitimate concern, is how that can become problematic when the app we're talking about is used to facilitate therapy. In other words, it's creepy, but mostly harmless for some analytics company to know when and how often you play Candy Crush. It's a whole other can of worms when they know when and how often you're in therapy. Now, I, I don't think it's fair to say BetterHelp is deceptive about any of this. I know nobody reads the fine print, but where the hell else are you going to put a statement like, also, we do as much data sharing as the next app? And uh, to, to the extent that it is problematic, we kind of have to weigh that against BetterHelp's 
mission to destigmatize therapy, which really lines up with what we do, as well as all the listeners that have contacted us to thank us for turning them on to BetterHelp services. Yeah, it's really important to note that we've heard from, I would say, almost a dozen people at this point who have tried or could afford therapy for the first time because of BetterHelp. Yeah. And that's literally a life-saving service. It's not to be undervalued, especially when it's weighed against the incredibly vague concept of digital privacy. Right. Yeah. Not to say that digital privacy is not important, but yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're aware of the article. Yes, we discussed it internally and now we've discussed it on the show and, and shared those concerns. But after taking all that in, we're going to continue to partner with them. And I don't feel like, you know, I mean, I feel like we can do so with a clear conscience. Yeah. The idea of metadata privacy, it's certainly worth talking about for all types of digital interaction. Every time you use a search engine, similar things happen. And when it comes to stuff like healthcare information, even metadata surrounding that, I'd like to see the rules about data collection be extra strict in those cases. Definitely a major political issue right now. But in this case, the very tangible benefit of many listeners finding the care they need feels like a big plus that outweighs the less tangible minus. And I'm basing that just on the listeners we know about who reached out to say they like the service. Hopefully, many more found good help quietly. Right. Yeah. And on a similar note, by the way, I should point out that we do drop sponsors if we feel like they're being deceptive. We have in the in the past case in point, a couple of listeners who work in IT fields and shit contacted us over the last couple of months with concerns about our ads for IP Vanish, thinking that maybe they were deceptive. Now, they weren't saying that IP Vanish was a bad company or anything, just that the ad copy said stuff that wasn't necessarily true or left people with a wrong impression about what their products could do. We looked into it. We agreed with the listeners. We dropped IP Vanish as an advertiser. Now, once we did that, we kind of had to run out our existing contract with them. That's just kind of how this shit works. But it's it's run out now and you won't hear any more ads for them on our show unless you're listening to the archives. So if you ever think one of our sponsors is deceptive or problematic or that you have information that you think we might want to know about that sponsor, please, by all means, let us know, right? Like, write to us, email us, tweet us, whatever. We want to hear it. It just doesn't always mean we're going to drop that advertiser. Yeah, maybe do a quick Google first, Joe, before you send that email. Just do a little quick Google. No, but tell us stuff. That definitely yeah. <laughs> includes when you hear a pre-roll ad for, you know, a Republican candidate for office yeah. or a bigoted Christian university. <laughs> we don't choose the content for those pre-rolls, but we've told the advertising people to very specifically ban those types of ads from our shows, but it seems like they sneak through once in a while. E either way, I do kind of enjoy the idea that Liberty University technically paid money to advertise to our yeah, audience. Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> Completely wasted that money. But regardless, definitely let us know. Feedback is always appreciated about ads or otherwise. I'm wrong a lot about lots of stuff. I need to be told. It's true, he does. He thought woolly mammoths were still alive one time, guys. That's not, like in a zoo. I think he thought they, they were in a zoo. I didn't think they were alive in a zoo. I thought that maybe it's, it doesn't matter. That's all the feedback you get. <laughs> if you want more, keep sending us those emails and tweets and Facebook messages and uh, tweet your questions to at PIAT pod. Before we slide back into position for the next person tonight, I want to thank you one last time for your patience while we were on break. It's nice to be gone for a bit, but it's way nicer to be back. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me a job that I miss while I'm on vacation. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. Yes, it's back. An even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Boobies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Nita, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this wouldn't be much of an episode if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for being the hero that Gotham wants, Lucid Illusions for being the hero that Gotham needs, and Eli Bosnick for, let's face it, being the hero that Gotham winds up with. I also want to thank Jenna for the librarian for providing this week's Farnsworth quote completely unrelated to the know it all diatribe I did, but you know, kind of worked out pretty well, complimented it, I think. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people who I can't thank by name because I'm having no end of trouble with my email today, apparently. It's kind of a shit week to be the internet, I guess, but I promise that I will exuberantly compliment you next week. And if you'd like to be exuberantly complimented alongside with them, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode. Or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you're not gonna, that's okay. You got your own shit to deal with. I get it. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you can find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. I really feel like we should have a contest 
with the listeners to see like who can like come up with the most specific kinky thing to write to John Piper about that they, that he'll still read on the air. Yes. Right? <laughs> I think that's a good contest. I'll make a t-shirt. Yeah. No, we'll send you a shirt. We'll, we'll autograph a shirt or something. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.